Hello and welcome. You are listening to a podcast, an only okay podcast, starring your favorite dads and your favorite sons. You have entered a realm of madness, a miasma of ever-worsening melancholy that intensifies with every turn the world takes. Ladies and gentlemen, dads and sons, my fellow co-hosts Matt Visual and Liam Edwards, we have discovered a new issue facing the entire human species. And I'm not saying it is aliens, but it's probably aliens. Have you guys heard this shit? It is incredible. I've already seen most of it was debunked, so I don't know how much fun you have. Well, well, I I, I love it. Let's get into it. Yeah, let's. I'm I'm fine with it. Let's be the meme. Let's embrace the meme. Unfolding hour by hour yesterday, and and I I I was having the time of my life imagining (laughs) the possibilities we may be in store for soon. I never thought you'd be on Tom DeLonge's side of the alien discussion there george but i'm i'm here for the ride i i'm all about tom dongs anyways so back in december of 2017 there started to to become a little bit more of a groundswell in serious media coverage over military ufo sightings the uh department of defense confirmed the legitimacy of some leaked videos that are admittedly pretty scratchy and grainy and fuzzy what a surprise kind of look like the the pilot chasing a little black speck on the camera the black speck in question was was being registered on both radar and ir and on camera footage and there's quotes from pilots about how through their eyeballs they looked like white tic tac blimpy type objects and what happened yesterday is that the pentagon a, a, a different layer of the the military industrial complex confirmed the legitimacy of more videos that were made in 2019 and uh there's going to be a congressional report on it in congress in public uh they they have confirmed that they formed the unexplained aerial phenomenon joint task force that are going to assemble a report and present it to congress in about 6 weeks there is for the first time in recent memory, fairly serious media coverage from ser- fairly serious outlets like the Washington Post and the New Yorkers, who are quoting interviews from these pilots who are saying that they saw these things every day and that they they could be some sort of new aspect of, a, of an arms race going on between the, the superpowers. I mean, if I actually had to put my surgery money down on it, I'd, I'd put it down on optical illusions, like a deliberate light show, like a, a d- new kind of fighter jet spoofing countermeasure. A lot of this UFO footage looks like there's something there on the camera, yeah, but not necessarily a physical solid object. And there's also a possibility it could be like a, a slow moving bird or balloon or something that looks like a blob on the camera with the crazy exaggerated speed looking in the back background from the parallax effect. So, you know, there are some plausible explanations. It, it might not be aliens, <laughs> but but it's aliens. <laughs> so I, I'm getting my first question to you, George, is do you really yes. believe that it could be aliens? Oh, it could be aliens. Yes, I believe it could be aliens. So what always fascinates me about this is how it's always America. It's always yeah. America. It's never any single other country on the entire planet that somehow comes into contact with aliens. It's yeah. always only America, which is very suspicious. It's almost like you have a giant defense military budget that needs reasons to keep spending money. The reason it might be America is also because America has the the Cthulhu tentacles of its military industrial complex in so many places across the world that they are in a unique position to have the kind of people and equipment and and chain of bureaucracy to confirm this stuff in in various remote parts of the world. Like apparently this was happening above the ocean in the in the Pacific Ocean in the middle of nowhere and I mean, technically right now, China has the largest navy, so maybe you'll also hear some stuff coming out from China soon about it. They're also working (laughs) in their space program, and there was also the story of a Chinese rocket falling down from the sky a week ago. (laughs) You know, not saying it's aliens, but... It's aliens. But, but, but... (laughs) It's not aliens, man. It's it's always suspiciously America. Yeah. (laughs) I want it to be aliens, trust me. 
But Dude, I want it to be aliens, aliens so bad. No, no, God, you don't. I want aliens. Guys, no, no, you don't. <laughs> Why Trust. not? Why not? <laughs> I can't remember specifically what the lore is. So, fun fact about me, when I was in university, my major was computer science, but my minor was astronomy, and I studied a little bit about space, and it's hella fun and exciting. Yeah. But, I mean, nobody talks about aliens in astronomy for obvious reasons, because you don't make scientific experiment, experiments about things that don't exist, potentially. But, yeah. the one, I can't remember specifically what the lore is, but there is a high probability that if an alien species had the technology to get here to be able to come to our planet yeah and especially come to yeah. our planet undetected yeah yeah we are yeah. more yeah. likely fucked yeah yeah we yeah, are sure. one Absolutely. entirely fucked i'm finding what the lore is called you guys discuss your fantasies i still want the fantasy of aliens because i want the fantasy of dying in an alien invasion rather than dying of old age. It would be far less depressing to go out knowing that humanity is not the problem that killed humanity. I know, it does seem quite boring at this point. I don't know about that. I, I would rather I would just a uh, 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 skip of, of, of advancement so we can just hurry up and get to go into ridiculous places. Other than staying but, here on this boring ass fucking earth. Yeah, and you know, that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is the aliens invade and blink us out of existence with their superior technology. But I have to wonder if they are capable of 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 reaching the level of technology and and surplus of uh not having any sort of resource crisis that would prevent interstellar space travel they would have gone beyond the means of needing to to conquer earthlings for their resources so i think if if there are aliens they might be friendly well that's the other like the other theory is that if they have the ability to if they have the technology to be able to come to other planets they will have transcended beyond right war right. And famine. They're, they're in the Star Trek utopia. Yeah, fantasy. they're in the globalization. Yeah, the Starfleet, which is what we should all be moving towards anyway. I totally, fully, I'm on board with that. And this is vacation. Earth is vacation for them. F so for them, they would come as a non warfaring species because they will have maybe eradicated war and they don't see it beneficial. So if they did come here, <laughs> that would be great. But what would they want from us? What do you mean? They'd probably more likely keep us pets or something. Yeah. To learn. Oh, oh, bo <laughs> vulture mites. <laughs> well, so, well, somehow I found comfort <laughs> in that. No, Whether the aliens are assholes or cool, chill dudes, I'd still rather there be there than not. Because then, like, like, dude, guy, I'm living in an abyss of nothingness. Like, <laughs> like, there is a comfort in things like religion and conspiracy theories that knowing confirmed aliens are out there would fill a hole in my life of, like, existential support that I feel I need to, uh, you know, know that, that I'm contributing to a species that may be capable of one day eradicating war and traveling through <laughs> space and figuring out how to break the laws of physics and all that sort of fun stuff. I think dying in an alien invasion from, from evil, violent invaders would be better than looking for my deathbed copy of Metal Gear Solid 3 whenever that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Deathbed copy of Metal Gear Solid 3. That's a quarter and a half. But if you look at it from a game theory perspective oh, of the no. prisoner's dilemma <laughs> and of all the dude. shitty options in which you have to, uh, like, live the next few decades, an alien invasion that kills us all would be pretty darn, like, you know, it would be the prisoner's dilemma. It would be, it would be the way to rat out your friends in order to have a better situation for everybody. I mean, not really, but you know, you know what I'm getting at, right? Yes, it would be exciting, but on the, on the toss of the coin of whether it would be very bad for all of us, I'm willing to stave off alien contact until I'm at least 60. Or 70. Hmm. Oh, that is a good plan, Because then actually. I would still get yeah, to see it yeah. all unfold. I just also don't have my life cut short, because there is no doubt they would come not bearing peace, I believe. <laughs> they would be like, literally, after watching Invincible, there will be some omni... What are they called, Matt? Like the... Uh, Viltramite. Viltramites, yeah. There'll be some form of Viltramite out there who is like, 
just the only reason they got tech is because only the strongest survive and they just <laughs> are nothing but warfaring <laughs> warmongering people and they just develop tech at a fast rate so they can engorge planets like that would i imagine it's just fascinating that the universe is so huge right and we have we have come into contact with no one we have no hard evidence uh yet well, well i mean listen if there's a lot of aliens out there it's impossible for the governments just to hide all of it unless you know those are some sneaky ass aliens because that would that would that would go to prove that the world's governments are smarter than the aliens yeah, and that's not that's not even a thing. At hiding them, which is not true. Or the aliens, when they arrive here, they die. Yeah, yeah. no, no. You know, I, I would love to know what aliens would look like. I think that would be fascinating, and it would it would flip everything on its head. It would be fun. Or it'd be really boring, and they'd come from a planet that has almost exactly the same atmosphere <laughs> and makeup as well us, and they look J just a spaceship, sort of like us, but just but a spaceship though. They're like sort of like us, but they have hands on their neck. <laughs> You're like, uh, we developed these extra hands. <laughs> Great. That's some like Rick and Morty fucking parallel <laughs> universe. Don't like that. Uh uh. <laughs> what, what if they look like the bunny people from Final Fantasy? Sign me up. Oh. Sign me up. <laughs> Which brings us to the next logical question of our Sign alien fantasy here. <laughs> the, memes, the memes the 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 basement dwellers that would love that would you fuck the aliens <laughs> if they uh, look like they look like the vera from final fantasy oh boy yes i guess <laughs> i'm stepping out of this conversation <laughs> that's because you know what your answer is matt <laughs> george posed the question liam had an immediate answer Matt Look, is just like fading into the background. If you didn't have a crush on what's the name, Freya, whatever oh, yeah, her name is yeah. from Twelve, come on, something's wrong with you. Yeah, <laughs> come on, sign me up for that interspecies breeding program. What if, what if uh, if if the aliens look ugly and goopy? You still wouldn't fuck them just for the novelty of it, just to say you did. No, no, <laughs> what? No. All right. George is saying something. <laughs> yeah. He's just ready to stick his... See, this is the type of talk we're not supposed to... Uh, <laughs> have when we ask money else. <laughs> so, so the alien like, like bodily design is something that, that, that I think would add a kind of depressing dimension to this sort of thing. Because they, they, they are statistically likely to exist somewhere out there in the universe. You know, the problem is how would they be able to travel around statistically, it statistically it's not actually it's like we have so many mathematical quandaries on our own planet at like the the no point no 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 to the decimal point of like infinity on our own planet that when you take into the scale of the university it, it, the university the universe that the mathematical probabilities are so incomprehensible to us uh, that actually it's not statistically guaranteed at all or in any way shape or form and it's so possible that the universe is so massive that there is an entire realm of other alien races that all know about each other all exist together in some mass effect harmony but it's so far away from us that neither their technology nor ours will ever reach mm -hmm. it's one thing going to mars but it's another thing like <laughs> going to another fucking solar system yeah, like a, Mars is like a bus trip for those guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, I, 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 I thought like the math of the scale of the universe, you know, the Carl Sagan quote, more stars than there are grains of sand in the ocean. And the prevalence that like those, those primordial elements like oxygen and water show up within our own solar system because there is water ice on Mars. There yeah. is an ocean of water underneath the surface of Europa that I thought it was like... The, the scientific consensus that it is statistically likely that there is aliens out there like like this was this was in the not in our galaxy from what i remember it, everything keeps growing so expanding not expanding so right expanding. right so so if there's going to be aliens yeah. like we have to capitalize on it sooner rather than later <laughs> capitalize <laughs> do we have the technology. tech to capitalize <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, who we can't, our phones don't even last the whole fucking day. We can't even day. ban people like, from social media <laughs> for saying racist words. How the hell are we going to send people to space? Maybe yeah. the aliens are intervening to solve all that shit. Yeah, they're going to solve the climate crisis. No, because we would be racist to the aliens. No they're doubt. They're going to solve racism. They're going to they're going to solve the Trump gamer gates. <laughs> I can't imagine the Trump supporters with aliens. I don't believe that. they're aliens. <laughs> the, the aliens are going to come and enforce the the Israeli Palestine conflict to be peaceful. It's going to be magical. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah, next thing you know, it's going to be like a, a Hispanic woman for president next next year or whatever. <laughs> and they're like, uh, she's an alien. <laughs> like just because aliens exist uh, now. It's, I mean, oh, that, yes! Great. Oh my god, you're right! Oh my god! It would already be a case of people being like, I bet there was already aliens on the planet, and all of these <laughs> government officials that I don't like have been aliens ever yeah. since. I knew it. I knew I the lizard it. people existed. <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> more more ridiculous shit gets... It's gonna happen. Yeah. So if aliens show up, you're envisioning a situation where the conspiracy theory then shifts from the government covering up aliens to the government covering up alien shapeshifters that have infiltrated the government. <laughs> yep, that will be the next step because it's an exponential N value, isn't it? Like of ridiculousness. I yeah. honestly think that we'll create tech that will make um, CGI and you know deep fakes so realistic that that will. People will never believe that aliens came to the planet because they'll just think it's some ridiculous deep fake or something. <laughs> yeah. Before I'm wondering what's more likely, like just outright denial, or based on what's happened over the past year with the COVID crisis, if people would just outright deny they exist altogether. We are and... never going to reach global like a global consensus ever. You you mean never? I think over the pa past year has proved. There's no way you can without and I, this without is almost, aliens. No, with with democracy. I don't know. <laughs> like I don't think democracy and globalization can ever be two things that coexist, right? Therefore, you're always going to be having the freedom value that people can then just therefore deny and believe whatever they want and their right to free speech of crazy conspiracy theorists, and they can deny the existence of aliens, even if aliens did exist. I don't think we can reach that Star Trek platform, unfortunately. Well, in Star Trek, it still takes, like, a nuclear holocaust before it happens. Like, like a big yeah. cataclysmic world-changing event that forces it. Well, it's terrifying, because I, I read a couple of um, uh, books a couple of years ago about, uh, you know, ex-spies talking about world wars and stuff, and how they imagined World War Three would break out, and almost all of them unilaterally agree that class warfare in some part of the world where a world war that would trigger a nuclear holocaust immediately and then you think yeah. about what's ha been happening in the news this week and you're like uh-oh oh, oh yeah. boy uh -oh. yeah that, that's like always been the fear right that like uh -oh. a small unofficial terrorist launches the nukes instead of a government no no that's no that's the it, plot it's, of metal no, gear no, no, right it's no you would just get i mean even in a contentious point like palestine and israel right it's like you have western powers backing Israel, of course, but because they have CD weapons arms dealings with them, but then you have the majority of the people's voices against that, which can spiral out of control into protests and, and that tiny civil war that happens in, not tiny, but that civil war that happens in that area then is infecting all of these other places. And I think they spoke out about how that can spiral in the 21st century based on stuff like social media and stuff like that. So, you know, it is quite the more we progress forward with technology anyway it's terrifying let alone getting to space i'm kind of like you know elon's a bit of a dick but come on elon <laughs> take us to mars buddy <laughs> take us to mars He's i would trying. so much rather side with the aliens than elon it depends on what the aliens want from us yeah yeah that's bad. elon just wants to play wario on tv i mean come on he's harmless. I, I i see it as a kind of pascal's wager like <laughs> Because you can't beat the aliens. If the aliens are out to, to get us, then there's yes, no fighting be, that. Yeah, we would be so like So you really pets. have no choice but to have faith. It is like religion. You have no choice but to have faith, you know? Apart from you can choose not to be religious. You can choose not to be religious, but in that case, you're having faith in some unprovably nebulous concept. No, you're not. You're atheist. Therefore, the concept is not... It's not what... <laughs> it's not what faith and religion is.
I can't believe you took us on a 22 minute tangent about aliens. Right Speaking from the get go. Of capitalism and globalism infecting smaller parts of the world with alien contagions. <laughs> I see that you guys finished Resident Evil Village. Yeah. Matt, did you finish as well? Yeah. Me too. Ooh, spoiler cast. Oh my god, Matt, we did exactly the same thing this week. Yeah. I just we realized. Did. We did. <laughs> We put we finished the same game and watched the same anime yeah. without even realizing it. <laughs> Jujutsu Kaisen. Holy shit. Yeah. Jujutsu Kaisen. Yeah. Damn. Okay. So yeah, I finished eight. Oh my god. Matt, right out of the gate, how much out of ten would you give it? You know. Here it comes. It's not a bad game. I would say a Seven point five. Resident mm. the, Resident Evil Eight is not quite an eight. <laughs> with I would give it. <laughs> I w- I would give it an a, a, a Resident Evil Eight out of eight. I would. Which is I I think is still deserving of that because it's not a it's not a bad game. It's not a bad game at all. At all. No. It's an enjoyable game. It's just like missing something for me. I don't know. It's just <laughs> missing something. Mm. I understand what you mean. I I beat it though. Yeah. <laughs> no I doubt. Did, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I did too, which is, you know, everybody knows is a fucking miracle yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. to finish a game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, had a, I had an enjoyable time and like towards the end, it definitely was dragging on a little bit. I would say the ending is probably the best part of the game. It is yes. probably the best part of the game. Yeah. The section just before the end, you know, when Chris is involved, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That part was very cathartic and very uh, pleasing after mm. the, you know, slog you'd been through of like playing as Ethan Winters for a long time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it yeah. was very cathartic. Let's put it that way. I enjoyed that section a lot. Oh, is that how they do the like the, the late game power trip section of, of Resident Evil? Yeah, there's a bit of that. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, Chris is a Marine. Imagine the kind of arsenal. He might have not a hero. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, that was very cathartic. Um, I think the ending is okay. Uh, I don't mean the boss fight. I mean, like, yeah, no, fuck that shit. <laughs> that, that was a shitty ass boss fight. Uh, I mean, like, just like where they might, wh- where I thought they were going to take Ethan, they're going to go with that character that we saw at the end. Mm. That is, you know, and I yeah. think, because it's going to be their story in nine. I liked how they, yeah, I liked how they sort of tied everything together at the end between that and seven. You know, mm. there was a lot of nice tying up. I think they did a good job of that. Because, like, Ethan, like, I don't understand. Ethan could do the same amount of weird shit that his wife can do. But he doesn't do anything but put back his limbs. Like it's just he didn't. He didn't know. I'm, I'm that, that's a bit of a spoiler, but he doesn't do anything cool. We're in weirdly like light spoiler territory. Here. Yeah. No, because he didn't know, or he doesn't know, supposedly, or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. Even though he put back a whole fucking. <laughs> he gets stabbed like constantly. He has his hand torn off constantly. Poor bastard. Honestly. He has the worst day. The one thing I will criticize it for, and we talked about a little bit about it last week, so I don't want to retread that too much, but is the development of the characters, right? So you have this boss at the end of the game. Everybody knows Lord Miranda, right? Says it in the marketing. This woman who runs the village, right? Yeah. You don't learn a damn single fucking thing about her until you walk into one room at the end of the game and then read like 20 pages of notes that are spread around the entire room. And you learn. Yeah. Fuck all else. And it's so bad. Like, I'm going to fight this boss. Why do I care? Like, why do I care? Yeah, it's it's really care. not good. It's not very good. It, th- all right. So slight spoilers here. I tried to explain this to someone. S- what's the story of Resident Evil 8? So your daughter gets kidnapped. Because she's powerful for some reason. And then they cut her up into little pieces and put them into boxes. And you have to go to each little section of the game where there's another boss holding a piece of your child. 
and it's just like they're looking at me like what and i'm like yeah that doesn't sound good coming out my mouth but that's what that's what it is and you know that you know that big tall woman who you know is definitely the main character well <laughs> sorry <laughs> depending yeah. on how good you are at the game you'll be done with her within an hour <laughs> yeah. and then you'll meet three other people one of them who has an interesting segment but has no story development whatsoever another one who is just absolutely terrible and then a last one who's a really just weird looking dante ripoff who just talks in swears at you constantly uh but doesn't do anything yeah. I did enjoy his boss fight, though. I did enjoy the boss fight with Heisenberg. Yeah. I liked that. I liked that segment. It was good. Yeah, the, the, the whole factory was just very. Was, I very hated long. it. I hated yeah. it. Not that I hated it, but like it was you, so. You had long. to waste so much S- ammo during know, that section. Those mechanical bastards. Oh, God. Sorry, everybody. Full spoilers here, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the be- the best way to do it is just like just to snipe the, yeah. the little heart thing, but it's just like so annoying. It's just like I don't want to. <laughs> they do remind me of the regenerators, but like mechanical versions of the regenerators from four. Yeah. But that segment, man. Oh god, it drags on for so long, and it is kind of scary. So you take it slow. It's not. It's not as scary, but they turn all the lights off, and you have to turn all the lights back on, and it's a bit of a pain in the ass. And the boss fight against the guy with the giant plane turbine on his head also really bad yeah just move to the left shoot him from behind move to the right yeah, shoot from I, behind it got so boring after a while because it took a while it took a while to do this and i'm just like he's so easy to dodge i didn't get hit once but it's taking so long to kill him and I'm yes just, i i just I, there's moments like that where i'm just like I'm just playing this game at this point. Like, I'm just on autopilot. <laughs> it is a you bit know? like that. You you do realize that you're not going to die because the game's not hard. But you're also yeah. just kind of like, the game doesn't really tell you what to do. But, you know, you're, you're, they have glowy weak points. <laughs> and, you can, and you can get around them and stuff like that. And so it's, I don't know. I really enjoy uh, what, what was the game we played back then? Was it Resident Evil 2, the remake? Is, is it yeah. Resident Evil 2 remake? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That game, I feel, was a... I wouldn't say it's a better game, but like it felt the it felt weapons. Shorter. Yeah, it, it was short. I think. Well, I it took it was me what, ten, eight hours to get through eight. Eight took about ten hours for me, and it felt really long. Yeah, it did feel really long. Yeah, it felt really long because like the time that you're like, I don't know how the timer counts because it's definitely not ten hours. I definitely was playing it for like thirteen, but like only like when you're in certain areas or like when you're not. When you're like at the altar and stuff like that, like the resting place, I don't think it counts your time. Uh, so, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But it was super weird because it did feel really long. Because as I said last week, it's really well paced for like the first, I gotta say, up to Benevento, the doll person. And then it just like, meh, doesn't know what it's doing. Like you go to the mill and it like ends within 30 minutes. And yeah, the mill. I thought I was going to be able to go back to the mill. But I did it. I wanted to roll those balls around in that the the castle diorama thing. I I only got to do one of those. Yeah, they cut you off, and they they don't really yeah. tell you that you're gonna be at a point of no return. I think. Well, I think you do New Game Plus or something, and you have all your stuff. Stuff. Yeah, because yeah. they have all those extra weapons at the end that you can buy. It, infinite ammo in the extra content shop. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Man, that Chris segment so good. Just wailing on those werewolves. Love it. Love it. I did not like the part where you had to shoot the house thing on the, the, the vines. That was annoying as fuck. That was oh, yeah, game. yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was yeah. so annoying. Yeah. But good thing for a lot of ammo, though. That's for sure. It was fun, though. I did enjoy it. I had a good time. I thought it was a good, good game. Like, there are frustrations, I think, mostly to do with, like, character development and stuff like that. But in terms of playing the game like you know you kind of i feel like if you go onto autopilot and you're going through it like that's a good thing right you're engrossed and you're you know yeah. you carry, you want to just keep playing i feel like the shooting and stuff was pretty tight actually once i tweaked the controls a bit to be a bit faster like turning and stuff i thought like the shooting was good when you got like the magnum and stuff and you start just blowing people's heads off and you're like yeah this is more yeah. like it there was a little bit of thinking it's not a lot of ammo yeah. Yeah, for the Magnum, yeah. I, I hate the ammo stuff, man. I always do. 
I always hate the ammo stuff. I, I spent I like never... the first, <laughs> I spent like the first four or five hours not using the crafting because I would find enough ammo. Yeah. And then at the end of the game, I'm like pausing the game to craft like every fucking five every minutes because I ran out of ammo. Thing. It's like, uh, uh, craft, uh, craft, uh, craft. I just run around zombies, just skip them sometimes. When I know I can just skip them, I'll just skip them. Oh, but I they killed block everything. You, in the most... <laughs> you killed everything? I, I oh, just... Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I... Just... I think I only ran past one thing, and it was one of the mechanical dudes in the factory because I didn't yeah. have any ammo. And it was the first mm -hmm. time I didn't have any. I probably had a stack of, like, uh, crafting stuff. <laughs> like a stack. Just a whole, a whole stack, game's stacks. worth. And thinking that I'm going to need it, didn't use it at all because I'm <laughs> so stingy. Just like, I got to wait for that, that moment where I need it. <laughs> I just killed everything. <laughs> I would say like um, the only like stressful s section that I kind of enjoyed was uh, when you had to fight the, the boss for the, at the stronghold, the Lycan boss. That was fun. Oh, I, it was it okay. Was it was kind of easy. I did. I yeah, And the one was. thing I don't like about there are two times when two bosses do something that's really frustrating, which is they jump at you. Right. Yeah, and you can't so, see like, because the FOV is so small. And you can't see because the FOV and you're in first person <laughs> and you can't see anything. And it's yeah. like, why do you do this? Like, ah, uh, like when he jumps onto that cliff and then jumps at you and the attack does like almost all of your health. Yep. And you're like, Dude, this is so unfair. I can't see him. Why are you putting him so far I, back? I, 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 used, I went behind the pillars and shot explosive rounds. I just dropped died. mines everywhere. <laughs> uh, oh, I used mines for the, the sludge guy. Yes. Yeah, that was, I, I used the rocket launcher. Yeah. He, it was like the only way. I didn't even the understand. Stupid! Oh my god! Yeah, that one was a bit annoying because, like, in his second phase, you're like, "Wait, when does he open his mouth?" But like, I don't know. Were, yeah, yeah it was, mines, basically. Yeah, it was a good game. I really, I did enjoy it. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I almost wanted to play it again because I wanted to do what I've done with previous Resident Evil's, where I run through it like again. Yeah, it has its pitfalls, but like for a triple A, you know, big budget release this year, it's pretty, pretty damn good. Like. It's a good 10 hour to 12 hour time. Ben Shapiro, Ethan Winters, he gets a bit better towards the end. He's not so annoying. Yeah. Towards the end, he's definitely like, man, I'm pissed. <laughs> he's, he's taking it out on everybody. Yeah. What the fuck you do with my daughter? I'm going <laughs> to fuck you up. <laughs> yeah. If you lie to me, I'll kill you. <laughs> he definitely gets really angry and irate towards the end, like to, especially yeah. towards Heisenberg. So, yeah, that was a good time. Yeah. George, are we done spoiling? Yeah. George, you should play it. <laughs> I will. I will. Like, I, my plan is to wait to see if any kind of VR announcement happens after the PSVR 2 or whatever they're going to call it is official. I think I know why. I think we just literally discussed why it might not be in VR. <laughs> yeah. I did overhear a little bit about, like, the first person animations being clumsy or something. I don't they just know, do but stuff that is my that plan. In VR, I don't think it would be great. Yeah. Like, I'm thinking of, like, the boss fights you'd have to do. Yeah. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, no, wait. Actually, huh. now that I think about it, you, you wouldn't be able to do any of the boss fights. That would have to be completely re redone. Yeah. That just makes me more curious. Even if an announcement doesn't happen, I'll be playing it in a year and a half anyway. And then, you know, whenever... <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's genuinely surprised that Resident Evil 9 is announced, I'll, I'll end up playing it around that it was funny to see that one of the um how many sales they made from a bundle that included seven and nine a lot of people ended up playing through both these games at once just now and that's that's neat right wait what sorry say that again uh that i saw that they were selling a bundle of re7 plus nine and nine? That they had nine when did nine come out I mean, I mean, eight, my bad, oh, of yeah, uh, yeah. RE7 plus eight, and that they, yeah. they ended up, like, like that was a significant slice of the pie of their I, sales. But by the way, it's impossible, almost impossible, to find 
just the base game on Steam. Really? You think so? You can't just click the base game like you can do with other bundles. It always gives the seven, uh, seventy nine ninety nine one, and then you have to search it. You have to search it and click it, and it doesn't even give you put you to the main page. Like it's just the weirdest fucking way to do it. I wonder if it still happens. Yeah, you put Resident Evil in, just type it into Steam, and the seventy nine comes up first. The 59 is all the way at the bottom of the of That's the what the Microsoft Store was doing when the Xbox first launched. They did it with Assassin's Creed. And it was impossible to find the base game versions. And it's like, this is bullshit. The fuck are you doing? And when you click the bundle, you can't just click. You just can't click the, the regular one. You, can't, you, you have to go within that one. Go to info. Then click Resident Evil Village. And then you're at the 59 one. Like, and no, and actually, no, it brings you right back to the page where it says 79.99. Just had the cart. It was, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. But it could be, it could be acting a little bit different now that I have it in my, uh, in my, in my, uh, library now. Mm. But yeah, that, that's bad. I don't, I don't like, that always rubs me the wrong way. Stuff like that. Um, it's just like, um, Warzone. When I used to play Warzone, you would click the free bundle under under store, and it'll always take you to a paid bundle for like a split second. Every f- first time you click the free bundle to download the free bundle with free like gun packs and shit. Like just why is that glitch there? To mistakenly spend your points, your your battle your battle points? Yeah, man. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Some bullshit, man. Some bullshit. When thinking back on my memories of RE7, I am totally happy with how I waited for the VR set to be in my living room before I played that game like a year after launch. I'm super duper happy I played RE7 in VR for my first impressions, and I'm also super duper happy that back in those days, I played Subnautica in VR for the first time for my first impressions. Uh Aha, what have you uh, been doing? That Subnautica VR run... Playing an early access game, George? Oh, no, no. It released out in uh, 1.0 yesterday. Oh, seriously? You bought a game on launch? Yes, yes. I bought the, uh, because <laughs> as it turned, it was a-, a game I was actually planning on waiting and doing the same thing and being like, uh, the developers seem kind of iffy on it, but I'll wait and see if they release some sort of VR thing later on. As it turns out, while the game was in early access, the fans had it covered and they, they have a VR mod for Subnautica Below Zero that actually, like, has better features than the real official VR support in the first game. And the moment I saw that news, <laughs> like, like that's that that was what settled the purchase. It got decent reviews, it has a decent VR mode, and now that I'm, like, actually playing it, it's, it's, it is absolutely a, a decent, good, Totally what I was expecting and wanting follow up. Subnautica Below Zero is good. It uh That's good has a lot of quality of life features above the first game that speed things up and smooth things over. The problem of not knowing where to go or what to do or uh, how intimidating the grinding curve was to climb over in the first game is smoothed over in this one just by sheer plain old level design. Uh, your starting looks area better. has, it looks beautiful. God, it looks gorgeous in VR. And um, the the caverns are a hell of a lot deeper and darker and more complex and more scary. There is a lot going on yeah. in terms of sheer raw level design. And that was one of the original game's strengths was uh, like uh, writing the line of, of a procedural generated survival crafting game, but one that was actually a handcrafted, deliberately paced game that whole time. This has a lot of those same strengths. The similarly compelling story one of the surprising things about the first game i enjoyed was that uh despite looking and feeling and playing like this blobby open-ended directionless survival game it had a cast of relatable characters with well-written diaries that you're picking up along the way that gradually evolved into a story driven decision making moments that that directly tied the ending of the game to your own actions instead of just following the trail of dead people the story in this one's good they they have it better they have your own main character leaving you permanent diary logs telling you what to do
to and where to go and what sort of materials you need to be grinding up. I'm sure people don't like that, but I definitely like that <laughs> more than the first one. Yeah. Because, like, you're you're getting stuck. Like, I remember going on the alien ship for the first time on the first one and just being stuck there. You can't get out once you're in and not having a certain material that I need. So I got stuck. I got stuck on the ship. Not being able to go anywhere. <laughs> is it like your old self? Or like, how do they s plot the story of you somehow leaving notes? You were playing a character who is trying to find a sister who was doing research on the same planet, I believe, from the first game. But you're exploring the Arctic region of it. So there's lots of uh, ice uh, around. And one of the differences... Ah, below zero. Eh, and, and one of the... the the things that really points out the difference in philosophy of level design compared to the first game is uh, that in that first game, when you first begin Subnautica and you go out of the escape pod, there's just open water in every direction. And you kind of just have to, like, make a bet that that alien, that the spaceship crashed over the horizon is where you need to go to start the story. In this one, when you climb out of the pod, you start at a little tutorial area with a tunnel of ice walls around you. Uh, the ice walls create a lot more of, of that funneling effect to make sure that you're looking at the right place at the right time as you go through a wide open sandboxy level experience. I, I do think it might be confusing going into this if you haven't gone through the first game because the story kind of sort of makes some references to things that happen at the end of the first game, but it also has a higher difficulty curve to climb. It feels like resources are handed to you at a faster rate, but that there are more predators that will chase you faster and spawn into you faster. There's more environmental damages. It seems like my character has less breath than I remember the character in Subnautica 1 having. So what they ended up doing is putting these little Sonic the Hedgehog 2 air bubbles at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so, so that even if you're caught underwater with ice above you and you can't escape and it's horrifying and terrifying, you still have some options scattered around, deliberately placed around the levels that will uh, create interesting situations all the freaking way through. I was also very, 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 very happy that the horror is still there and still hits just as hard in VR as as it's really supposed to. Like, e even after all these years and getting used to the VR legs and playing completely through Subnautica 1 for like 80 hours inside a headset, I still get that primal gut fear from looking out. Once the, the shelf of the ocean floor dips down and you just see blackness below you in every single direction, you, you don't need to hear anything scary. You don't need to see anything explicitly scary. Just like, the depth of that and the vulnerability that you feel from seeing nothingness every time you move your face in every direction, it activates something in me. It is an extremely intense feeling of of your of the animal parts of your brain knowing you are out of your elemental environment that no other game I, I still have played since that first one has been able to trigger until this one again. So it is more of the same. It is more Subnautica. Uh, better, smoother, streamlined, and it's still like 30 bucks. It seems like this is this is going to be a real good time. A super fun adventure. Is it scary? Oh, yes. Subnautica is in VR and even in, in the flat pancake mode is is going to be one of the most like if you have that fear of the deep sea and big ski monsters that I'm sure we all do. It is one of the more intense games to struggle through in terms of fighting the fear that is built into your like bodily instincts that's that, that weirdly incorporates that as part of the game design like there's a lot of places i just didn't want to go and things i didn't want to look at Ooh. because it's so damn scary <laughs> like the the deep the, the ocean how uh my, your my toes get a chill like my brain starts expecting things to be nipping at my toes like like when you're wading barefoot through through mud or something and you start to get used to little bits on your on your feet it's like this game made my brain go go back to nature mode <laughs> it made me it made me truly feel like like i was i was out of my environment one of the the reasons why it, it really i feel transcends from just a great horror game great vr game to one of the greatest games of all time is that that's paced with the chiller moments of basking in the beauty of it all too Subnautica is a game of, of chill, quiet beauty 
that is punctuated by extremely long, 10 minute long adventures into the sheer abyss of elemental terrors your brain was evolved to fear. <laughs> it is a brilliant game. It reminded me of how much I loved the first game, and I... Uh, besides the the cute little penguin characters kind of glitching out and hovering above the ground, besides some of the, the weather effects looking a little weird with the lighting, it's still a little janky. I don't have many complaints besides aesthetic jank like that. It's still mostly all positives. Like after after last night's four or five hour session, I don't I don't think I have any big negatives on my list. Just the just the one asterisk at the bottom. Do you think it's better than the first one? I don't know. The early game does feel a lot smoother than the first one. I am getting more story beats faster. I am getting more building upgrades faster. Within that first four hour, four or five hour session, you already get the uh, hab builder tool that brings you right into the base building aspect of the game at a far earlier point in the loop. But I do think that the higher difficulty curve and the kind of naturally spookier environment that comes from the giant ice walls of being in the, the below zero zone does make it not as great a candidate for someone's first experience with Subnautica over the mm. first game. It might be a sequel that might be, you know, a little better than the first game, but I don't think it'll be remembered as everyone's introduction to Subnautica and blowing them away with like those super unique first impressions I was describing. Why is the mod better than the official support for VR? The first game had very rudimentary bare bones VR support, and there were some menus that straight up did not work. You would, uh, I remember having to save the game right in front of a keypad on a door, reloading the game in pancake mode because in VR, the keypad, I was not able to interact with it. I believe you also could not move on the Y axis. Like if you moved your head up and down, in Subnautica 1 in VR, it would not track with your character's movement. So the ideal way to play IMO is in a swivel chair where you're not going to be moving your body around that much with a wireless controller. Both of those problems are fixed by this unofficial fan mod in Below Zero, as well as having quality of life accessibility sliders in the options screen, where you can customize how far away from your face the PDA is so that you don't have the problem of the first game where the text was too blurry to read in VR. That was, that was a big issue. Like, a lot of little issues like that are, are corrected while it still nails a lot of the same, same core strengths of, of the first game that made it such a unique, wonderful adventure in my mind. Yeah, and again, once again, it's like mostly a nonviolent game, too. You, I have not felt any temptation, even though I have a knife. I have not felt any temptation to use it that whole time, because it's like... Dealing with the actual enemies in that game, the giant leviathan predator monsters, that's like the aliens. They're either going to kill you or not. You either, you don't fight them. You either avoid them and hope for the best. <laughs> you're training to fight the aliens already, and you're like, I'm ready. I can do this in VR. I can do this in real life. Bring on the aliens. Oh, you can't fight those aliens. The sea monsters in Subnautica, it is a, a more a amnesia style experience where the gameplay is more in cleverly avoiding them. And I, I, I really appreciate how a game can have a deep sense of fear and horror and danger and be absolutely terrifying and scary and, and a violent struggle against a violent world, despite not having the video game mass murdering going on. Hmm. Yeah, good time. Recommended. So far, so good. If you haven't played Subnautica 1, maybe start with that one. If you haven't, and if you feel brave, maybe start with this one. It's a good time either way. But wait a year until it's on sale. Actually, yes. Save your money for surgery, kids. <laughs> if you don't really want it right now, do the thing you do with every transaction in your life and think, hmm, what else could I spend this money on? Uh, McDonald's. Honestly. Yeah. Or Resident Evil 8. Don't buy McDonald's, guys. That, that, avoid McDonald's. That's not even food anymore. It's not even food. I tried to crunch wrap, what, like a few months ago? And I was just like, what the fuck is this shit? Taco <laughs> Bell, what have you done to my Crunchwrap? It's been years since I tried it, but... Oh, it was Taco Bell. It's been years since I tried the Crunchwrap, but when I tasted it, I was like, oh, oh, you guys have changed everything. It's also smaller. How dare you? Fast food used to be really great. It's okay in Japan. <laughs> I'm not going to complain about McDonald's in Japan. Well, it's a little bit different there. You got black burgers over there. You don't got that shit here. I'm, I'm telling you, the, the world's always getting worse. So it's the aliens that are going to have to break us out of this. As long as my McDonald's breakfast stays consistent, bring on the aliens. It's Big okay. breakfast.
Big breakfast. Heck yeah. That's like that's like a staple for you, isn't it? Every time you're drunk, you just get big breakfast. Man, you got like... to, man. <laughs> How the hell am I going to kill myself? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, Tones in Japan is good. You guys ended up accidentally watching the same anime on oh, the same Oh, do we get week? to talk about... Yeah, do no, we get to talk about just, Jujutsu Kaisen? We just watch what's popular. Okay, we're just we're just part of the hive. Okay, me and Liam. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we're already connected to the alien mother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just had the same brain communication thoughts. Yeah. Uh, I started watching it because it's been on Japanese Netflix for months and months and months, and I wanted to watch it, but it didn't have English subtitles. Uh, and then all of a sudden, last week, I think they added English subtitles to it. So finally got around to watching uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, coincidentally at the same time as Matt. Yeah. And it's it's really good. It is weird it's, though. Let, 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 don't is. don't just rush. It it is fucking weird, man. Is it is it about jujitsu? No. no, no, not not that jujitsu. Uh, jujitsu. Uh, spelled spelled differently. You gotta tell me is the because I know you're watching uh, the Japanese version of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, of I'm watching the dub on HBO Max. Right, HBO Max has like their own dub on. On it and it's weird. Okay, does <laughs> this Japanese version have have weird moments? Yeah, I mean there are weird character moments for sure. Like I'm on episode fourteen. I don't know where okay. you're at. Yeah, I'm I'm at the last two. Okay, right. So when you meet Toto, the big guy. Yeah, yeah. Like him asking those weird. What type questions. of woman do you like? What type of woman do you like? Are you interested in? Like yeah. yeah. It's very, very Japanese, a little oh, bit. Okay, I don't know how okay. it comes across in English. But oh, um, oh. in terms of, like, the anime itself, I don't know. Does it get weirder? Or... They make references everywhere about, like, American shit. Oh, no. It's really just, yeah. Like, it's, they talk about video games. They talk about, like, all sorts of shit. And I'm just like. They talk about movies a fair bit. Like, they yeah. put human centipede in there and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, it's just so weird. It's like, it's like a fan <laughs> A fan anime, like someone like, oh, I like these things. <laughs> and I want to talk about the animation because sometimes they, you know, they cut corners, but, but then in other times yeah, the other they're time, like spinning the camera around. It's, it's like, fucking amazing. It's fucking amazing. Like <laughs> this is the Shonen. Has Shonen raised the bar? They do what Netflix need to fucking learn to do, which is they blend CG 3D with 2D animation perfectly, yes. like even to a point where you don't notice it. Like you always yes. notice it in Attack on Titan, but in this you don't notice it that often. And it's really good and really subtly well done. It's what I learned in Blender, because yeah. Blender does the same thing with Grease Pencil. It's the good. The same thing. It, and so when I look at it, I was like, oh my God, this is exactly, <laughs> this is exactly the shit I want to do. Like it's, they spin the camera around so much. And I'm like, they have to draw all this shit. And they, it, they make it easy to follow what's going on, even though that's happening. It's really well done. I, I do like the fight scenes in this a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of those uh, impact moments are uh, mm. quite nice. So, for yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, it's essentially a show about... <sighs> ghost hunters essentially they're like these people called jujitsu sorcerers who are essentially people who can see ghost curses ghosts. like that are ghosts but they're spawned from like the anger of humans and like if somebody dies or something and they have resentment in their heart like if george passed away he would create a giant curse out of the hatred within his heart for not seeing the aliens it's gonna be so disappointing if they never show up yeah, I know, right? Um, so then these things form into manifestations called cursed spirits, and then you have the jujitsu sorcerers, and then in a very shown and typical way, they're the people who slaughter them. They're all different types of rankings. They go to school. They have a tournament. <laughs> it's very, oh, sh okay. it's very okay. shonen, <laughs> but it's different as well. Like it doesn't. It's it's more adult. 
I, uh, you know, than stuff mm-hmm. like Boku no Hero. There's blood everywhere. The first sentence of the plot synopsis is very interesting and makes me wonder if those weird moments Matt was talking about have something to do with how the, the magic power energy comes from negative emotions specifically. Like, that almost sounds like what Silent Hill does to people. Yeah, it's a bit like that, actually. The manifestation of someone's negative emotions and guilt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, that, it, that sounds like like it could be really intense and personal and crunchy. It's good. It's a, it's a good show. It's a weird show. Yeah. But it's a good show. Like, uh, it comes into its own later on, I feel, as well. I've enjoyed it quite a lot so far um i really like binge watched the first couple of episodes because i was like oh this is really good yeah um i like the way everybody fights in different ways as well like shonen typically for years and years and years yeah. everybody has similar fighting styles that go against each other whereas this has you know quite interesting different powers uh i like and nanami. different types of characters too yeah yeah, yeah. i really like, like nanami and his like weird like percentage like he divides human beings into percentages and then finds their critical point and then hits yeah. their critical point. It's kind of cool. <laughs> and he's always checking the clock as he clocks out. Yeah, because he clocks like, his like time is. It's ridiculous. Like his power is on a time or something. Yeah, it's if you really want cool. a ridiculous, yeah, if you want a ridiculous action fact anime, this this is it. Like it's just so stupid, and I love it. Also, it's got two fantastic new shonen characters satoru gojo the teacher yes. the blindfolded teacher yes. who is absolutely a legend gorgeous he, he's gorgeous he's amazing his eye <laughs> reveal is perfect it's ridiculous i was <laughs> I just like, oh, Matt, go that's what that's what i fell in love i was just like oh, okay yeah, yeah, i yeah, like yeah. this show <laughs> i like this guy <laughs> yeah, and yeah. gonna say the main character you know itadori kun like he's great He's like the embodiment of, and people are going to hate this, but he's like Luffy and Naruto and a little bit of like an idiot, maybe a bit more of an idiot than those characters, like all wrapped into one. But that, that kind of like, I fight my, for my friends, but it's not so overdone. He's just like, yeah. I'm going to get stronger. <laughs> he's kind of stupid. And he's, he's really great too. Uh, both of them are great. And for Shonen, it moves fast. Yes, super, super quick, actually. To, to, to the point that I don't, I don't know how it's the shonen. Sometimes it just skips things. Yeah, it's just, it's just straight up just like, they, they don't dwell on anything. Like, oh, he's learning. Oh, wow, he's really strong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. When did he learn to do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, there's like, oh, fuck it. Like, you don't need to see all that. Like, I, I'm, I'm very curious on how they're going to make this long. Or maybe, what, should do, are shonen some shonen shorter? Uh, yeah, it depends on whether the manga is still running, right? Like, it all really depends on how the manga runs. You know, Attack on Titans ended. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, I'm scared to look it up. I don't even want to look it up. Yeah. Uh, no, it's still, it's like, um, it's on volume 17. So the, the manga is still ongoing because it's really popular in Japan. And it's becoming one of the more popular now, right next to Kimetsu no Yaiba, the Demon Slayer one. So I think it'll be going for a, a, sh- a couple of while. There's 24 episodes right now, season one and season two. It's a good time. I'm enjoying it. Season two? Wait, what? Uh, season two is after episode 12, when the intro changed. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. HBO just puts it all on season one, I think, which is weird. So are you only up to episode 12 or episode? No, 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 no. I'm I'm at 22 or some whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, in Japan, it's like there are two seasons. So it's the 12 episodes, then the 12 episodes. So 24 episodes total. Yeah, I'm deep in there. I want to say, though, um, another thing that made me really, really like this anime is the animation for the outro for the first season. (gasps) The dancing. It's like almost JoJo-esque. It's brilliant. I like all their outfits. Everybody Tokyo grooving. (laughs) It's so good. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I listen to it every time. (laughs) Every time. Every, Every time. time, like that's the first. Like it's been a while since I listened to an outro and watched the animation. Just the way they animate the dancing, I was just like, "Oh, damn! This, this shit's pretty sweet." Okay, but yeah, yeah, Jujutsu Kaisen. Like that, that's that's watch that. That's a that's a good one. It's a good time. It's yeah, time. I, I, I yeah. it as well. Yeah. Don't worry, George. You don't have to watch it. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how i'd be able to uh 
keep a long running fun thing like that going in today's media landscape of misery and pain and constant drama. Oh boy. The gaming news keeps flooding in. Yes, that's true. Maybe we should talk said game. I haven't even looked, which terrifies me. I haven't looked at the docket. Uh oh. Well, since last week, uh, there's been some uh, uh, leaked tech specs over the PSVR 2. They're, they're talking about foveated rendering and a 4K resolution. Uh, yeah. Disco Elysium has made it through the Australian classification process. Finally. And getting refused and then classified. And it seems like the whole experience is shining some spotlights on how backwards their certification system is. Do uh, Australia is also going to be beginning a, a tax cut program for game developers? Yeah, very, very eventful news, huh? Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was also a game journalism scandal. The the first one. That's the one. Wait, wait, wait. That, that that sounds bad. It wasn't. It games journalists got wrapped up in a corporate scandal. I think is a better way to put it. There, there were game journalists who wrote articles at Game Informer and IGN directing readers to charities to uh, help out Palestinian civilians who are currently having their homes bombed in the latest and nastiest in recent memory escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. These were articles that um, listed some like fairly well-known nonpartisan charities like the UN Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, uh, alongside some more localized ones like the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, Medical Aid for Palestinians, and Friends of Al-Aqsa, which um, shares uh, some, some legal and lobbying resources specifically related to the evictions going on over there. But this article ended up getting taken down, and a statement was released on Twitter from the IGN official account saying that that post was, quote, not in line with our intent of trying to show support for all people impacted by tragic events, and that by highlighting only one population, the post mistakenly left the impression that we were politically aligned with one side. I, I think it is also important to know the context of just how asymmetrical this conflict is and the nastier, grittier realities of some of the numbers, like how 45% of the population of Palestine right now is children. And children don't really have a choice in terms of what side of an asymmetrical conflict they have the shit luck of being born on. These were charities that were pretty, by and large, aimed at helping out the children, the civilians, the not the militants connected to Hamas on the Palestinian side. There was a huge, huge gulf in a lot of uh, game journalism social accounts over how this is a familiar classic example of like corporate higher ups at a, at a media outlet determining what the editorial board can and can't say underneath them. The next day, on May 17th, an open letter was written and published on Medium.com by a lot of IGN staffers who were not just from the editorial department, but several others as well. And uh, they had signatures signed on the bottom digitally with uh, social posts updated to the minute of the publication corroborating us to confirm that this open letter was really written and agreed upon by the IGN staff. They're saying, we, the undersigned employees of IGN, are appalled by the recent management decision to subvert our editorial autonomy and remove our post directing aid to the Palestinian civilians currently suffering a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The takedown took place in the early hours of the morning on a weekend with no communication to its initial authors, the general IGN staff, or to the public as to why it happens. IGN's editorial team has guidelines about updating content deemed needful of changes, which you will oftentimes see in many other IGN articles, even the controversial ones throughout their history. These things get planted with updates. They don't typically get straight up taken down. The letter continues to say, wholesale removal of pieces without posting an explanatory statement is expressly against our usual policy. Our staff received a late night email from IGN leadership well after reasonable working hours for the global team that had the same statement that was to be released publicly on the IGN Twitter account. There was no indication in the initial email that it would also serve as our official statement on the matter. Uh, yeah, that's 
that's that's the story i just want to applaud ign the people i know at ign for co-signing uh co-signing that letter yeah this is this is a big deal i think it feels like a big deal for me and for them doing it in the first place one you guys need the union right that is without a shadow of a doubt mm-hmm. secondly there was like a lot of people taking unnecessary pot shots about like well if I was working for a company that did that. I would resign immediately, which first off, right, understandably, corporate, terrible. But don't ever say that about someone's job and their livelihood. You don't understand their livelihood. You don't understand their their necessity in life and money, and especially in a pandemic. That was terrible as well. But for everybody at IGN who is working there and putting their jobs on the line to one, post the original article that had all of the links to the charities, to then secondly have that taken down, which means, of course, their corporate overlords were not happy about it, to then still publicly post a letter with their names attached to it is very brave of them and speaks a lot about, you know, what we should be focusing on in this conflict and that kind of thing. Um, So I just want to applaud them for that. It's incredibly brave of them. When I was watching this unfold, I want to point out that a lot of that initial push that you were talking about, that, like, you, you do find distasteful about the 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 calls to resign over this i i i know of the individual who did that push and it was a former kotaku writer who was unionized who did have the protections to make that kind of threat the kotaku unionization efforts were happening during a scandal in which a writer left specifically laura kate dale over the really, really stupid Persona article that she was kind of sort of forced to write about the Persona music, potentially saying an ableist slur when the musician tells the band to retort. People have resigned before over less to good results. And I know that that is absolutely positively not something that most people are going to have the privilege to be able to do. No, we should never, ever say that. We should ne- We shouldn't say people should resign because somebody something out of their control uh, who they work for decided to do something i them coming out with a letter to rebuke what happened to actively say i am against what has happened but it's out of our control i think is enough of a stance to take in this kind of thing that someone should put their livelihood on the line for this kind of thing and i would not be surprised if someone in that list who is in a better situation than the others I, I would not be surprised if, if someone does out there does end up resigning over this. I think somebody will resign, I probably, but, you know, that's their choice. I think people out there saying, well, you should resign from IGN, IGN's bad. It's like, nobody understands their, you know, what their lively situation is, you know? They might require medicine. They might have a family to feed. That's an entirely different thing to what the... Surgery. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, this is an entirely different thing to the original point which is even more frustrating is that people are saying this when we're detracting from the whole reason people are trying to put this post out there uh, you know about the conflicts uh and the complete abhorrent things that are happening in gaza right now it is kotaku that is the one outlet that also has the unionized editorial staff that is seemingly able to report on this thank god so there definitely is some some correlation there between the article's not getting taken down and whether the, the writers are unionized or not. Well, it's like you can't, um, I think if you unionized, you can't, you can't legally detract their voice and then replace it and claim that all staff apologize, blah, 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 like, or something like that. Um, there was some legality. The idea is that the staff would then go on strike with a strike fund paid for by their union yeah, dues also, that yeah. are also used to negotiate a higher wage with which to pay for more surgeries with maybe given some leverage for some health benefits too for those surgical operations that you maybe don't have to pay for out of your own money if your employer can give you insurance for it i'm in two minds about the whole i hate people who say games are shoot games like take politics out of games of course not like Politics isn't everything, and you should pay attention to these things. But at the same time, I think there is this weird, unique, egotistic nature of the games industry where it has to put its foot in everything, whether rightly or wrongly. And that leads to some very sour things that unnecessarily need to happen. The difference here, though, is that IGN is one of the... It sometimes ranks in the top 15 websites of the entire yeah. internet. Yeah. It has such a large scale impact if 
internationally, considering all their different branches, we're not going to mention IGN Israel here, who quite rightly, you know, are... They are in the story. Yeah, at nobody... At some point in the listable, they're there. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't even believe that's a thing, to be honest, but... You know, they have such a large-scale impact when they talk about things. If they tweet something, it goes to, like, a million people, right? You can't just say, oh, take politics out of games, blah, blah, blah. Not when it's that massive, you know? There is sometimes this egotistical thing where it's like the games industry feels the need to tackle everything. And I don't think that is healthy. But this is completely different. We're talking about companies that are have such an outreach to people across the entire globe that, you know, even if that if they put that article up and then save the children get, let's say, an extra 10K in donations, that is already worth it. And yeah, I just want to, you know, applaud the people at IGN for doing that. Um, yes. The stick to politics argument counteracts the five qualifiers of newsworthiness, of timing, significance, proximity, prominence, and human history. This is a story that, because of IGN's size and audience, absolutely fits all of those qualifiers. And it might be surprising to many gamers to think, why should IGN care about civilians getting bombed in Palestine? And that is because of the proximity to their community. They are such a big site with so many international readers that it is absolutely likely someone is going to know someone who's going to be affected by this. Yeah. When you reach a certain scale, like, you can't, you can't ignore that stuff. And even at the same time, like, the, the, the escapism that, that we engage in with video games still comes from a place of, of taking resources out of the real world to do it. And that is always a political conflict. It's people who make games, right? And if people get affected by politics, then therefore their video games will get affected. They're, they don't exist in a vacuum. In more inspiring, uplifting news, uh, you know, for more positive spin after the downer, uh, we have this very, very cool story. This story is the best. Is the best. The lead composer of Final Fantasy XIV, mm -hmm. Masayoshi Soken, uh, mm -hmm. making the announcement that he was actually in the hospital with cancer while making some of this game's soundtracks. He was fighting cancer throughout the whole development cycle and was actually in the hospital when making this track called To The Edge that has lyrics that are actually about never giving hope and fighting as hard as you can. There was a stage show um, called the, the, the Final Fantasy XIV Fan Fest where another guy, um, the, the director and producer, Yoshida, uh, he said that, that Soken just like needed some kind of music making in his life to, to justify his life. Soken said, quote, if I don't have something to do, then I don't have anything to live for, so don't change anything. He said he didn't want to sit there and do nothing, so there was a special arrangement being made. He didn't even tell anyone at the time. Until October 2020, he spent six to seven months hospitalized. Uh, now, nowadays, the cancer is almost in full remission. But, uh, yeah, damn. What a, what a, what a badass. I watched the video of the FanFest. I had it on briefly through the weekend. I still keep up with Final Fantasy XIV from time to time, but the FanFest stuff is always pretty good to watch. But I watched the video and I actually was on the phone to my mom and it was on mute and I just saw Yoshida crying on the stage and them talking about Soken, who obviously is quite a fan favorite composer because he's quite goofy and kitty and he makes great music and stuff. And I thought he was retiring. Like I, I was watching it on mute and I thought, oh, maybe he's retiring and he's leaving the dev team. And then I went back and I watched it and I was like, oh my God, that I did not expect. But it is quite an emotional thing to watch. And people make games. I think we just, we literally just said this about the IGN piece. Like people make games and, you know, the fact that he would carry on making music for the game and while going through something like that it's, you know it screams memories of Iwata and like Iwata sound working while he had cancer as well um ah, man it, it, it hit hard i think the fact that he's out there back on the stage making music and it's in full almost full remission is amazing news it's a really emotional thing to watch and i i'm so happy for him and you can tell how much he meant to Yoshida-san as well and the team and the fact that some of the team members who are standing on that stage with him are hearing at the same time we are in the video that that had happened 
is quite emotional as well. A lot of tears and stuff, but it's a great, really positive story. And yeah, definitely watch the video. It's a, uh, it gives you nice, <laughs> nice feelings. So, I mean, the quotes do make it sound like he had a choice in the matter, that they, that they weren't exactly forcing this and that like he no, wanted no. to do it. They spoke a little bit at FanFest as well about overwork and working and stuff like that. And they were very specifically, Yoshida-san, for all accounts from what I've heard from people who've worked with him and also people who've met him, I, I've, I've actually met him and spoke to him for a brief time. He's lovely and great <laughs> to work under because he pays a lot of attention to Western development as well. Um, he plays a lot of like World of Warcraft and Ultima and stuff like that. He, you know, a lot of what Final Fantasy XIV has been built on the success of is him researching into Western games, but he also pays attention to Western development and the talk of crunch and culture that, uh, you know, overworking culture in the West has affected how they develop things at Square Enix as well. Um, so it's great to see all those types of things happening over there too. So I think, you know, in this case, I kind of understand so concerned that if something happened to you, you'd still want to keep working. I would anyway. I mean, distracting yourself and, and having something to live for, you know, they think about the placebos and the, you know, the, the ability to, you know, push yourself through these things with more positive feeling. Um, I definitely think it was something for the good of him to do that. Yeah, no, this was... This was definitely a highlight after after all the after all the misery. Fuck yeah. Welcome back, Soken. Good shit. Yeah, very positive. Very good stuff. All right. Let's do questions. Uh Dad and Sons Podcast at gmail.com. Send send that thing questions. We're 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 almost at the bottom of the previous pile. We still have a big ass pile to go through on our Patreon listener questions Get channel, them in. which which always, always gets one one shot included in here. So if you want to shoot your shot, better chances in the Patreon, good enough chances Stop in the email. You shoot your shot. <laughs> Wait, is that like bad? Is that a thing? <laughs> no. It's just it's kind bad. of, it sounds kind of euphemistic when you're saying it. Oh, fuck. I didn't, I, but everyone says it now. I didn't. I didn't even, uh, I thought it was like shooting a gun <laughs> at a moving target, so it's better to take the shot than not. It definitely means like take your chance, right? But I, right. I thought you were, Ill, you were almost, because you kept repeating it, it sounded like a euphemism. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, uh, if you want to take your chance. <laughs> <laughs> you want to blow you, your load. If you want to, um, no, I... If you want to increase your odds of a successful set. We're going to have to keep this chat down, aren't we, in a couple of weeks' time. We're going to have to calm down. Speaking of boiling testosterone, uh, uh, bubbling up to the surface of your skin, Whoa. Mr. Bubbles wants to know Ugh. What, what is better for yourself. Why did we choose our lifestyles? Facial hair or no facial hair? If, you know, we, we did choose. I'm the only one without a beard, so I'm just going to answer this straight up. I can't grow a beard. <laughs> I'm not dad enough. Fair enough. Can't argue against that. I could. It's just I'd look like a shit Father Santa, uh, Santa Claus. Oh, wait. Is it like irregular or? Uh, it is patchy. And also, you know, I'm mm. blonde. So I think I have a bit of the Swedish old, like I'd have like a white beard, I think. Can't grow anything mighty like Matt. Even George, you know, you've got to kill a beard as well. Yeah, yeah. You got a very I mean, white guy beard. Okay. Yeah, because you know, I started the channel out with the goatee, but um Yeah, that that yeah. You know how, how the, the the twenties to thirties male life cycle goes, the less hair on top, the more hair you tend to have uh on on your mouth instead. Yes. I, I've been I, blessed I, with top hair, not lip hair. I, I experimented with a beard, a full beard, a year and a half into the channel after people said the goatee looked ridiculous, and I was very, very <laughs> happy with how the beard looked instead. Yes. Yeah, I think the beard, yeah, you do good in a beard, but, I mean, we're talking to the king here, baby. The man, Shinji's dad and that going to... Nothing on top, all on bottom. All on bottom. <laughs> I, if you ever uh, go back to my relic of a YouTube channel, you um, look so I change my yeah. my styles over mm -hmm. and over oh, yeah. and over again. I had mohawks. I saw a fan art picture of yeah. you like when we started the podcast and like, oh my god, even then. Yeah, completely different. I did not know you during the mohawk era. <laughs> yeah, I had a mohawk at some point. Hey, you met me after that, after the mohawk uh -huh. era. 
Uh huh. Yeah. And it's it's always like so weird to remember that uh that people have such like long complicated lives before you're involved. You know. Yeah. Because I do find it so much harder to picture you with the mohawk, even though the pictures are out there, the videos are out there, but mm -hmm. like that personal connection because I like your your off camera personality is something that my brain doesn't match to that mohawk even though it's the same person i <laughs> i don't know i don't know i was just trying different shit and now i'm just i i think i think i'm i'm close to my final form now yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah i know how you feel like it took me a while and then i just found like a hairstyle i liked and i'm like i'm just going to keep it like I'm this i'm going to keep I, this yeah i don't need to think well, about it i mean Looks we fine. we have a preview now we have the technology to like throw our our well, we don't. Our fans do have the technology to throw our faces into FaceTime apps, and uh, yeah, that was that was great. I get a great. sneak peek for what what we're gonna look like in forty years. Yeah. Oh I god, great I, as an I saw. Oh my god. Matt yeah, just looks they the kind of killed me inside. <laughs> Actually, I, I look like old Snake. It's great. I think I decided in that moment when I saw the image of me as an old man in the Discord that I would rather die in the alien invasion. What? Oh, is that what it is? Okay, so they caused May I, The okay. anxiety that triggered might uh, might have, have sparked the fantasy of going out in a heroic blaze of of uh, your your entire species' extinction, you know? Yeah. Instead of having a weird-looking, scruffy white beard in the same room I've lived in for, like, seven years already. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a spooky picture. What is spooky is that the room behind you doesn't change, even though your hair gets white and your wrinkles get old. I, I think I would find the picture a lot more comfortable if there was, you know, a hospital deathbed with a Metal Gear Solid 3 machine hooked up to it. <laughs> and now we, we've come full circle. Yeah. Nobody looks as good as I, I would argue like Snake looks incredible with a beard, right? Big Boss looks incredible. Right, right. But Matt is like... <laughs> You were never known for having a beard, but all of a sudden you've become like one of those men who you're like, damn, that's yeah, the beard I wear guy. It well. Yeah, I do you wear do. It well. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. That's why. So, I yeah, think it's when I you went I'll full. When you went full, like I'm just gonna commit to the the it's shaving of the head yeah. as well. Yeah, you're yeah. like, fuck it, I'm doing this. And it was yeah, that's the ratio. Yeah. The, the more goes away on top, the more have comes you, comes in on bottom. Have you ever yeah. seen the movie Bronson? No. Oh, great movie. One of Tom Hardy's best movies is about Charlie Bronson, this prisoner in the UK. He's named the most da dangerous prisoner in the UK. You, you, you've got a little bit of Bronson vibes about you, man. <laughs> Bronson. Let's see. Yeah. Got a bit of the Bronson vibes. He, he either has like a mustache or like a beard similar to George, but there's a couple of photos of him where he has like this full on massive beard. Oh yeah. my god! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the man's a the man's awesome. The movie <laughs> is fantastic. You should watch the movie. Tom Hardy's absolutely incredible in that movie. It's great. <laughs> I like what his glasses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, they're circular like Matt's, just they're kind of like yeah. tinted sunglasses. But yeah. you could cosplay him. <laughs> Bronson, Jesus, <laughs> great! Wow, it's not what I thought he was gonna look like as as, as a prisoner. Great movie. He looks kind of happy to be a prisoner. He is. He's he's psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> Cosplay Bronson also just sounds like a great name for a like a band. male model cosplay biz. Oh. No, like some sort of indie <laughs> rock band on Twitter. Oh, I love co Cosplay Bronson. They're my new favorite hit of summer 2021. What would a Cosplay Bronson YouTube channel be about? It would be about cooking and sometimes talking about uh lifestyle podcasts but from a man's a man who grooms himself i love I, this character I, he looks like dr he, robotnik in real life <laughs> like like if you copy pasted dr robotnik in real life you get bronson <laughs> he should have played dr robotnik instead of jim carrey <laughs> <laughs> jim oh, man. yeah yeah let's go to Juan S instead uh, uh, Juan S wants to know what our favorite bits of flavor text are. What is your most memorable piece of flavor text that you remember for good or bad reasons? Uh, I especially remember the guard slash groundskeeper itchy tasty diary and OG Resident Evil, barely understanding it with my English language to then get spooked by the zombie from the wardrobe. 
Also, the item descriptions in From Software games come to mind, like how the wooden shield in Bloodborne will straight up have the developers acknowledging game design. It says, it engenders passivity. <laughs> uh, sorry, George, but I've never read any Elder Scrolls flavor text too long didn't read. <laughs> I don't remember any. <laughs> Did we answer this already? We've had a similar question, but not the same. Uh, I can't remember so... which of the Dark Souls it is, but Shiny Stone. That <laughs> always stuck with me. Is that Dark Souls 1? I think it might be Dark Souls 2, actually. Where you, like, throw them in the pits of the Blight Town scaffolding areas? Maybe. There's one where you pick it up in the cavern. There's some crows around it. Oh, the crow's nest thing. It's in Dark yeah. Souls 3 as well, where you drop it. Oh, it might be 3, yeah. Well, maybe it's in it. everyone, but it says shiny stone. Shiny, shiny stone. Shiny stone. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Me reading the Elder Scrolls text directly like led to me reading IRL Greek Roman stuff. So like, I'm mean, no surprise there. Uh, one thing that is kind of new. Have you guys heard of of this Yik game? Uh, Y Roman numeral two W colon subtitle. A postmodern RPG. Yes. I've I've not played it myself, but I started diving into the very very complicated sordid world of that game's story. And it seems like the big deal going on is that the the writing, it, it seems like a great big example of how not to do flavor text, where it goes mm. on way too long. It's very, very long winded. Multiple characters in the game will explain the same thing to each other. Uh, and and good flavor text, I feel, needs to be out there and everywhere. But there's there are bad examples and it's probably harder to find the bad examples over the good examples games i think are a good medium for transmuting writing like disco elysium is 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 flavor text the game but we, it's not flavor just... text is it it's like that game relies on its dialogue right i think uh in this instance like when he says itchy tasty like resident evil doesn't rely on its you know narrative heavy side so these are like those odd notes that you pick up sometimes in a game just disco elysium has lots of Fun odd notes. Oh, you guys are also playing through the near games. Okay, Liam, have you gotten to your second run yet? No. <laughs> yeah. I actually Googled. I Googled I it today. I hate that so much. Yeah. Have you gotten well, to your second run yet? Oh, God. I Googled it today. I Googled it today how long to beat near. Because I'm about 10 or well, 11 hours in, and I'm having an okay time. It's fine. Like, it's that's, fine. That's. That's kind of how I felt. It's fine. But on your second run, it starts doing really cool things with flavor text and subtitles. Okay, and yeah. So I, that's what I'm holding out for. I'm like pushing myself to get to that. And honestly, if I don't ha have an enjoyable time through those, through, you know, the different endings and whatnot, I will be throwing some punches towards some people who have convinced me to stick with it. Um Unlike the YouTube comments from like two weeks ago that was slating Matt when it, Matt was like, there are no good RPGs. And that everyone's like, Matt, you refuse to play Nier. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Fucking Nier? Nier? <laughs> Fuck that shit, man. I, I don't, don't, know I don't why, need but... to see ass in my face 24-7. No, right? Just as a quick aside, like, of course, we're answering somebody's question. But speaking of like tidbits and off bits of information. Playing Nier made me realize how fucking dumb it is of a game mechanic that you walk around in a town that is empty, talking to NPCs that don't do anything, who say the most random ass shit to you, and it only happens in JRPGs. Yeah. And in Nier, it's so ever-present. I walked up to a guy and he was like, don't forget to talk to me about spice. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you can't no. do anything else. I'm good. Don't forget. I'm fucking good. <laughs> I'm yeah. Scared. Like, oh, like, um, there's, like, another girl who's, like, hey, don't tell him about our secret ritual. <laughs> like, you never find out what these things are. But they're so off color because they have to be different. But it's so weird because in real life, these things would never happen, of course. But it's so weird how these became a trope in JRPGs. And they're just, like, in every JRPG. Just random NPC characters that don't do anything. You can just talk to them. And they will say one line of dialogue to you that's completely random and it's kind of frustrating <laughs> do the anti-war quotes at when you die in a call of duty game count as flavor text because <laughs> those have been looking more and more out of place 
the longer that series goes on. I think everyone should look at the 404 page from IGN's uh, article taken down with all of the quotes oh, it had on there that, <laughs> that clearly don't match what the, what just happened. Fucking Hollow Knight has not come out yet. Like, and guess what? Oh. They just they just announced that this year they'll have no announcements so far. <laughs> <laughs> God damn trolls, dude! That game is gonna be at least decent <laughs> with how long they're spending on it, and I'm okay with it. I can wait. I just I clicked the IGN. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I don't. <laughs> no, go on, go on, but I don't want to. Go on, do it. Post, uh, it's got to be a screenshot because it randomly generates a quote for you every time. It's almost like a game oh. of how tone deaf it'll look. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to play the fun game of of seeing what quote IGN will will stamp on its on its canceled Palestinian children's charity fundraiser, I will send you guys the link in Discord. I will post it in the description below the podcast. And just now, when I clicked this link, I got. Finish him by Shang Tsung. <laughs> the one I got from uh, when I looked at it was from Captain America, and it was like, "We don't play nice with bullies <gasps> no when bullies no, are squishing no way. The, the small." Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No fucking way! Oh yeah. my god! I, yeah. I I wonder if they'll. Holy shit! People kept tweeting oh. at them like, "You should take your four or four quotes down because it don't look good at all." That is it's definitely just... a worse one than what I got. Like, yeah. I I don't know if I. <laughs> could really like laugh at yours i thought mine like wow uh uh the president has been killed oh my god by <laughs> guess, guess, no. <laughs> guess what which one i just got oh. you are almost a jill sandwich barry oh. benton <laughs> no. oh. Oh, oh oh my god my i just god. got one from yoda pass on what you have learned uh, that's <laughs> that's the idea right yoda yeah yeah Something weird's happening in the world. You like report on it and let people know and pass that info on. Holy yeah. shit! A lot of these will be bad. Yeah. This is great. This is like the most offensive game we could. Oh, we could play ad libs. The I whoever makes Cards Against Humanity probably like like would have a field day with stuff like this. <laughs> wow! Wow! You could definitely play ad libs with this. This is this is pretty interesting. It does not do to dwell on oh. dreams and forget to live. Oh. Albus Dumbledore. Oh my soul. There's a quote by Gordon Freeman. Dot dot dot. <laughs> People who live in glass houses get pretty good at ducking. Manny Calavera. Oh my god. All of these could be read. Uh, and horrible metaphors could be read. Horrible in your windows. <laughs> Glados, Jesus Christ. You are not a good person. You know that, right? Good people don't end up here. <sighs> uh, it's pretty uh, good. It's pretty good. I, uh, uh, well, I, I think I, we, I, we derailed that one. Uh, yeah, childhood pets. We got a question about our childhood pets. <laughs> D Soul for Rent asks us, do you have or have you ever had a pet that isn't popular, like a snake, a rat, or a tarantula? If so, what was your favorite thing about that animal that made you love it? Yes. Just yes? I had two snakes and a lizard. Oh, yeah, you've talked about your snakes before. Yeah, I talked about the fact that I wanted to be a herpetologist before. No, I had two snakes. I had a, I had a herpes <laughs> a, a herpes <laughs> Um No, I had I had a corn snake to start called Eddie. Oh, that's and then cute. Eddie unfortunately passed away after a couple of years. And then I had a royal python, also known as a ball python, called Roxy. And she grew to about five foot long, and she was massive, but she was absolutely beautiful, and I loved her very dearly. My favorite thing about her was she didn't bite anybody. And she was very, very docile. Um, very, very good pets. And she, of course, was very beautiful. Uh, I miss having snakes. And then I had a lizard called Lenny, who was a gecko, a leopard gecko. Um, he was actually technically my brother's. And um, geckos are really funny when they shed uh, their skin. They can't stop licking their eyeballs to try and m remove the... Uh, the skin so that was kind of funny every time they would shed and do that 
Oh, eyeball skin? That's awesome. Cool. All yeah. right. Uh-huh. Um, man, reptiles are great pets. Honestly, I would have a snake now if I could. Very easy. You only have to feed them like once or twice a month, depending on the type of snake they are. You know, unfortunately, you have to have like a bag of dead mice in your freezer, though. That's a bit weird. Uh, with lizards, you feed them crickets or beetles and stuff. Um, but they're great pets. I, I had a great time. What about you guys? I had loads of animals when I was a kid. Do you guys grow up with pets at all? I, Not necessarily. I eat. had a goldfish, multiple <laughs> goldfish that fish. keep dying every time I went to school. And wow. I had a hamster, right? Mm. That Never had nine babies oh, two days oh, later. Wait, two <laughs> days after? Where did you get the hamster? Uh, from a pet store. They didn't know. Okay, they sold pregnant, you a pregnant so. hamster. Oh so my god! Did... Oh no! Yeah, and it was a very small case, so we had to give. Oh. Yeah, we had to give them I... give them back because they were like trampling all over each other and shit. Oh. They grow really fast, yeah, really fast. Oh, can I can I quickly tell you about my hamster story? <laughs> yeah. And if you if you feel sorry for animals, which I do, but uh, you might not want to. Uh, Listen to this story. Um, so we had a hamster, and I, I kid you not, this is true. His name was Lucky. His name was Lucky. He was my youngest brother, Jordan's That's hamster. ominous. Oh, That's boy. foreshadowing. You're, 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 you're in for a You're tree storytelling here. here. So, so uh, Lucky uh, was a great hamster. He was a cute hamster. He was a little bit of a biter, but he was very cute. We had him for about two years, and then one day, he was just missing. He was just missing. Uh, the cage was not open, but there was a little gnawing hole in the side, uh, oh. and he's missing. And we looked everywhere for him. We couldn't find him anywhere. He was on the, he was in my brother's bedroom on the second floor of the house and we couldn't find him anywhere, anywhere at all. And honest to God, days went past, um, and we're still looking for him. Can't find anything. Can't hear anything or, or anything. We're like, man, he must've just got out like of a door or a window or something. And now he's gone. And <laughs> we're eating dinner, right? Wait, yeah, don't don't worry. It doesn't go that weird. Uh, we're eating dinner oh, at, downstairs. Okay. You can and hear my, my dad, face. My dad is like, can you hear that? And I'm like, Everyone's like, what? And he's like, no, really, can you hear that? And we're like, you're joking or something. And he's like, no, 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 can you hear? It's like scratching. And he was like, then looking around, and it was like scratching from inside of the wall. Oh no. And then we could hear it and it was like scratching it and it was like something was in the wall. And we didn't immediately think it was lucky. But you know, it like moved across and went into the bathroom like area. And essentially, my dad had to like saw open a part of the wall, and in there was lucky. Now the problem is he'd fallen, he'd gone into the bathroom next to my brother's bedroom and behind the sink was a hole down to the bottom floor where piping's meant to be and he'd obviously fallen down from there to the bottom and fallen into the wall now the problem with a hamster of that size was that smashed his spine and broke both of his back legs and he was kind of dragging himself on his front legs and uh so he was So he was scratching and we're thinking, you know, like, did he hear our voices? Was he scratching to try and get attention? I I don't know if Hamster that smart. Uh, Unfortunate to say, Lucky passed away within three days after that. Um, It was, you kept, you you kept, you kept him. He was, he was going to, he was going to die for sure. Like he couldn't, he literally was physically pushing. How did he eat? Well, he, I guess he didn't. We gave him food in the thing. It was only like maybe four or five days. So obviously hamsters, you know, they've got quite a bit of fat stored in them. But yeah, no, he, uh, watching um, me being 12 years old and watching this poor hamster drag its oh body, God. its broken oh, body. Oh my God. Yeah, oh. it was, uh, we always said not so lucky that, that that's terrible. That poor hamster. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's but terrible. Yeah, that was the story <laughs> of Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Lucky. Rest in peace. Pour one out for Lucky. Pour one out for Lucky. Just don't drop him down two floors. Woof. What about you, George? Do you have anything? I, I, I had a dog and a betta fish, but also for one year as a kid, I had a pair of birds. 
that had babies and laid eggs, and then I had four birds. Um, this was when my parents were living in a house that had a big screen porch, so we would let the birds fly around. And then a year after, we moved to a smaller house without a big screen porch, and the birds would have to stay in the cage, and we didn't want to do that, so my mom sold them to a bigger house that had a screen porch they could fly around in. Well, that's what she told me. Do you reckon she just released them into the wild? I don't know. I saw her sell, sell, sell them. Like, the people came. They were kind of biker types. It was weird. They were, like, wearing black leather and stuff. <laughs> cool. Cool. Not not gonna, exactly, you know, the eat demographic them. I would imagine. And I sure hope they didn't eat them, but uh <laughs> I think the the thing that I really enjoyed the most was like seeing the life cycle of these birds. Like I, I got to see them teach their uh kids how to fly. And oh, uh wow. that was really cool. Like that seeing like a family of animals grow up all in close proximity to each other and teach each other things like humans do was was probably a really powerful like experience for for you know learning learning about about life the birds the and beginning the beginning <laughs> and the ends of it that's that's what pets <laughs> teach kids yeah uh, it is it's a great i remember having to watch japanese elementary school children clean turtles and the way they like mishandled them and hold them just uh, oh god it oh, oh my god it yeah so much. Holy shit, I might have been a part of that. I remember, I, I almost forgot, when I was in kindergarten, the teacher let me take care of a turtle for a week, and I bet I was really bad at it back then. I, mean, I don't know I what people poor. think, like, yeah, oh, they're more durable because they have shells, but man, the way they were, these kids would, like, poke their heads and stuff like that. Oh, God. Pan doesn't have a great track record for animal care anyway. I wonder if they still do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that definitely seems like a childhood memory that is anachronistic against modern values. Animals are great. You should get a pet if you don't have one. Animals are great. Like this podcast. Ooh. You should get a pet like you should get more episodes of this podcast. And if ever there was a podcast that was a description of my hamster Lucky, it is a podcast that essentially is dragging itself by its two front arms. Oh, shit. <laughs> With a broken spine. I feel like I have more more respect for animals than i do this podcast <laughs> because it seems a little insulting to call a hamster an okay hamster but to call your own podcast an okay podcast, okay podcast is endearing yeah. and funny dude if i fell off a building broke my spine and both of my legs there's no way i would have survived as long as lucky did and i would be <laughs> by your bed playing oh, metal God. gear solid 3 with you for all two of those next days <laughs> as i whine through the night in the wait pain. no no it's it's got to be Xenoblade Chronicles 2, doesn't it? Like, no, what oh, game do you have to play before to. you die? <laughs> Liam, actually, oh, I have a great question to end us out on. Oh, I can't wait. Guys, okay, go we on, all then. know what mine is going to be. It's going to be Metal Gear Solid 3. But let's say the aliens invade and you have time enough to play one more game before they Death Star the planet and everyone gets zapped. What's the one game you play before dying in the alien invasion super mario world so i can go out i was i was about to say Z super mario world as well oh not xenoblade chronicles super mario world's still a pretty good choice too i wouldn't yeah yeah something like classic from the childhood yeah just so i can go out like i would time it perfectly so i can go out as the thank you for playing theme <laughs> for super mario world starts playing which always brings a tear to my eye because it's so overwhelmingly full of nostalgia. Um, I feel yeah. like that would be the apt nature of my life. The, the final moment of all four billion years of evolution that, that led to you. Imagine, George, just imagine if you were annihilated by aliens at the same time Big Boss salutes the grave of the boss. Yeah, I would rather do that than continue to live in a world where MGS4 and V and Peace Walker and portable ops and and then the, the 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 pressured into resigning and pt getting canceled and metal gear survive but at least i i, I mean i i might i don't know is is living long enough to see stuff like death stranding happen worth it because i really enjoyed death stranding if ever there was a way for george to end the podcast that was just it